Hang on. There, there we go. There we go. All right. So as I was saying, Jacob is the name is deceiver. And so he was already coming out of the womb, grabbing onto his brother Esau's heel. And so he got that name. And as you know, Esau's name is because he was red and he was very hairy like a fur coat. So turn your Bibles to Genesis 28 and let's lay some groundwork today for the message. Genesis 28. Once you found your place, if you'd stand for the reading of God's Word. Genesis 28. We're going to look at verses 10 to 22 here. And then after the reading, if you would, just hold your place there a minute as we continue to review. And then we're going to look at some key verses that are going to launch us into the message today. Verse 10 says, Jacob left Beersheba and went to, toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from that place, put it there as, at his head, and lay down on that place. And he dreamed, and a stairway was set on the ground with the top reaching to heaven, and God's angels were going up and down on it. Many of you know that as Jacob's ladder. Yahweh was standing there beside him, saying, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land that you are now sleeping on. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will be spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Did you hear that? All the peoples on where? Earth will be blessed because of who? The Jews. Right? Never forget that. God blesses those who bless His people. And God will punish those who go against His people. Verse 15. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head, set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named that place Bethel. Though previously this, the city was named Luz. Then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey. If he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear. And if I return to the, my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. The stone that I've set up as a marker will be God's house. And I will give you a tenth of all that you have given me. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I thank you, Saul, that I emphasized a few words. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But let me continue to lay the, the groundwork and as a review of previous messages that we're building upon here. Genesis 25, we have the birth of Jacob and Esau. And as you know, that also chapter deals with uh, Esau selling his birth right right to his brother Jacob. So we don't have time to go over all that today, but go back and refresh your minds about that. And I think most of us are familiar with that. So that was in uh, 25. And in chapter 27, we have the deception of Jacob to his father about getting the blessing. And, and the sad thing is, from the very beginning, God told the mother that the older will serve the younger. That, that Jacob was going to be the one who the blessing was going to go through. So he told him very clearly, and yet we still see no distrust, manipulation, right? And so all this is going on. That happened in chapter 27. If you're there in 27, go back with me to uh, verse 41 through 44. And let's refresh our part this as we go forward. The deception has happened, and, and Esau is quite angry, as you can imagine. He, he feels like he's been betrayed, and, and uh, his blessing's been stolen by his brother from his father. And so let's see what happened, remind ourselves what happened in verses 41 through 44. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Okay, let me just stop here for a second. 
Isaac is 160 years old. Okay? That's going to be important in just a second. Remember that. 160. He thinks he's near death. And so it was tradition for them to call and bless their sons. But he wanted to do a private ceremony. Remember? He, he didn't want to do it right. So he tried to hurry up and connive with his favorite son, which was Esau. And Rebekah heard about it. And so she calls Jacob. And they connive to make sure what God had promised was going to come to pass. Because God needs our help. Amen? That's what we have here. And so I want you to keep all that in mind. Here, here he is, 160 years old, all right? So he's near death. And so continue with me, verse 42. Verse 42. When the words of the, his older son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she summoned her younger son Jacob and said to him, Listen, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me. Flee at once to my brother Laban and Haran and stay, look at verse 44, and stay with him a what? Few days until your brother's anger subsides. Don't face your sin. Right? Let, let's don't worry about making things right. Let's just escape and, and don't deal with that, right? Don't deal with what you've done wrong. Just go ahead and escape and go to my brother Laban's house for a few days till your brother's rage, verse 45, turns away from you and forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? All right. Let me just lay a little groundwork. Earlier in my announcements, I, I, I told you about the up to coming weddings. And uh, one of the important things that's emphasized at a Christian wedding versus maybe a secular wedding is the fact that God has order that is established for the family. And sometimes, even talking about in church makes people uncomfortable because the world has distorted it so much that we're uncomfortable about it. But I just want to lay the groundwork again and remind us that when these two came together as one flesh, the wife was vowing before God that she would be the helpmate to her husband, the completer, and would support him, and that she would place herself under his authority as unto the Lord. The husband was vowing to God that he would be the provider the protector, and that he'd give himself to his wife as Christ gave himself for the church. That's what the roles are. That's what we see at a Christian wedding. And yet we see a lot of breakdown in those roles. We see some conniving going on. And the reason I wanted to point this here is, even though Rachel wanted to send her son away, she still knew that she could not do it without the Father's leadership and blessing and guidance. Look what happens, verse 30, 46. So Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hittite women, and Jacob marries a Hittite woman like one of them. What good is my life? In other words, Esau's already messed up and married an unsaved girl and has brought shame into the family. So they didn't want Jacob to do the same thing. And so Jacob was to go and marry into his family's same faith, right? Not being unequally yoked. And so look what verse 1 of 28 says. Isaac summoned Jacob, blessed him, commanded him, don't take a wife from the Canaanite women. Go at once to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become assembly of peoples. So they send him away. Just for a few days, right? If you know the story... Rachel didn't realize that those few days would turn into 20 years. Rachel didn't realize that that would be the last time she'd see her son's face again before she would die. So all of their manipulating what God had already placed in motion, the consequences of sin were great. Were great. They would never see each other again. Jacob would be running from his brother fearful that he would want to kill him. Let's go back to what we just read. As he's so journeyed and before he meets his future wife Rachel, we just read that passage there in verses 10 through 22. Look at verse 15 again. This is key here because what has just happened, God says, I'm still with you. 
And I think all of us need to be reminded of that, that none of us are perfect. We're all sinners. We're going to make foolish choices, foolish decisions. And sometimes we need to be reminded that God, if we're His children, is still going to be with us. But there's consequences to the choices we've made. But He's never going to throw us away. Never going to say, I'm finished with you. I don't love you. Or you can't be used anymore. And this is the life that we're going to see of Jacob. Here's a, an assignment I want to give you and I want you to go look at. You know the, the phrase, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Of those three names, which one do you think he says he's the God of the most? Wouldn't you think it would be Abraham? Father Abraham, great man of God. Anyone else? Jacob. Almost three times that number. And here's the reason why. Because as bad as Jacob was, God needed to remind the rest of the world that he is the God of those that are not always walking right. Those that may take a lifetime to get their lives in order. I'm that kind of God that loves them and is going to forbear with them. Long suffering and patience. We were just talking about that today. Is when we think of living in the end times, we think that can mean tomorrow, next week, or next year. And it could be. But when Paul wrote many of the epistles and when the Apostle John wrote Revelation, they thought it was immediate. And if we know about history, it's been over 2,000 years. And it has always been immediate because God has been working, but He is long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish, right? Not that wishing that any should go to hell. That all would come to repentance and ask for forgiveness. And that's what he was doing in the life of Jacob. He was wanting to change Jacob's life. This deceiver gave him a new name, which was Israel, Prince of God. Prince of God. Take him from a deceiver and make him a prince of God. So whatever you and I once were before we got saved, God wants to change our life. He's given us a new identity in Christ. And that's what we need to remind ourselves. We're not that same person. Right? And if you're not that person yet, and you're tired of where you're at, then this is the time to run to the cross and receive that grace. And so that you can receive a new name. Maybe on earth we won't call you by a different name, but you will have a new name in heaven. And your name will be written in the book of life. And so you'll have a new beginning. And so God tells Jacob, look, verse 15, I'm with you and I'll watch over you wherever you go. <clears throat> I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I've done all that I promised you. Jacob away from his home, away from his family, running from his brother. And God says, Jacob, your story's not done. Right? And how does Jacob respond? Look at this. These are the ifs. Verse 20. Well, first, let me don't skip over this. Verse 16. When Jacob woke up from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I did not know it. You, you know what he's saying there? Wow. I can't, I can't believe that God would be in a place like this. I mean, this ain't the church. This ain't some fancy place. Can you imagine that he's in a desolate place like this? Because he was a deceiver. And that's how the world says all the time. You ever hear people say, I don't go to the church house because uh, the ceiling might fall on me or lightning may hit me? They associate that God's only there. How about where they're at? God is there too, right? And, and that's what Jacob's saying here. Out of his own mouth, he's like, wow, I'm surprised. How can you be surprised when the creator of all things is everywhere? If I make my bed in heaven, where is he? What if I make it in hell? He's there too. We cannot escape the presence of God. And that's what we need to tell our kids all the time. You may escape the presence of your mother and your father, but you won't escape the presence of God. Right? He sees and knows all things. I may not see and know all things, but God has a way of revealing things. And even if He doesn't choose to reveal it to mom and daddy, He still will take care of it on His own accord. Right? And we saw that uh, over the last couple of weeks, that be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever we sow... A man shall reap, right? And so Jacob is sowing this deception, these lies, and he's going to reap it. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. He's going to reap it from his father-in-law. He's going to reap it from his own children, right? So, first of all, he says that. I can't believe God's in this place. And then he goes downhill from there. Verse 20. Jacob said, I'll make a vow. That sounds pretty good. 
right? And sometimes when you read over it, you, you, you really don't take time to really see what is being said. But let me show you. Verse 20, then Jacob made a vow, watch this, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey. If, didn't God just say he was going to be with him? So what's going on here, uh, Jacob? He's not trusting, right? If he provides for me on this journey, if he provides for me food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's house, all these ifs, doubting, not trusting God. God just said, and God has been good to Jacob, and yet Jacob is still playing games and is self-centered, self-focused. So, what is the vow that he's going to make to him? If God does this, you know, and, and we're like, wow, can you imagine what's going on in Jacob's heart? Kind of like when Nathan was talking to David. And what did David say? That wicked rich man that took from that poor man, he needs to be killed, right? And some of us might respond that way too. What is the problem with Jacob? God just said he'd be with him. Well, has God said he'd be with us? He, he tells us to go out and do the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go ye therefore in all the world, teaching and proclaiming the gospel, right? Making disciples. And lo, I am with you, what? Always to the ends of the earth. There's other places. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So God has promised to be with us, provide for us, right? There's so many more we could go on, on and on about, but I want you to go back and remind yourselves of those promises. Here was a promise given to Jacob. Jacob didn't take it completely to heart. And then he said, well, if God makes good on his promise, then here's what I'll do. Isn't that how the world is today? They make bargains with God. God, if you will spare my life, then I'll live for you. And yet they don't. God, if you'll just get my son or daughter right or just heal them, then I'll live for you. We, we try to bargain with God rather than coming to God on his terms. We try to come to God on our terms. And we were spiritually bankrupt. So what kind of terms do we have to offer God? None. All we can do is fall in humility and beg for his forgiveness and embrace that and realize there is nothing good in of us, nothing deserving, so therefore I cannot be bargaining with God. But here's Jacob, this deceiver, thinking that he can bargain with God. And so many people do that. And so if God makes good on his promises, here's what I'm going to do. Look at this. Verse 21. The Lord will be my God. So I'll go ahead and let him be my God. He'll be my Lord. What, what, what a deal, right? God's got a, a, a good one there, don't he? He's got a good representation right there, don't he? God, you do this for me, then I really will live for you. Instead of just living for you because you've loved me and I'm going to love you back. No, no, you're, you're going to have to give me some things first. Watch this. The stone that, you've, that uh, you give me for my pillow, I'll set up for a marker for you. So rather than you know, being a living sacrifice, I'm going to go ahead and just give you this little stone. Right? Here's your house. Right? And didn't God remind the Israelites, I don't need no house made of hands, my man. Right? I want to dwell in the hearts of my people. Right? I don't need a Pacific house. Like this place right here this morning, it is the place where we meet and we need to have reverence and respect. But when we leave this place, God is with us everywhere and we need to have the same respect for Him there that we do here. Right? We don't need to make dividers and say, well, on Sunday God's here, but Monday through Friday or Monday through Tuesday He's not, and then Wednesday we'll catch up with Him again at the church. Right? We need to see Him for who He really is. He goes, I'll set up a marker, and then look what else he says. Here, here's the good one. I will give him what? A tenth of all that he gives me. That's generous. God gives him 100%. He says, let me just give him a tenth, right? And we could, we, we could sit here for a while, but I'm not going to. I just want you to think about that. You know, God gives us 100%. Right? I'll give you more, God, if you give me more. Right? And that's the attitude sometimes. All that God had did for Jacob, all that he said he'd be there for him, even though he sinned, got himself in those pickles and problems, God says, I'm going to take care of you, Jacob. I'm going to bring you back. And so instead of saying, wow, I owe it all to you, God, and let me show you how grateful I am with a heart overflowing of love. He says, well, I'll give you a tenth. Kind of sounds like the Pharisees and the scribes. Let me give you a tenth of this little mint tree and a tenth over here and here. You know, to the exact penny rather than saying, God loves a cheerful giver. Right? And so somebody said, Timmy was telling me, somebody said that, uh, I don't like that being talked about giving a tenth. That's just the beginning. God wants more than a tenth. He wants our whole self. He, he, he's paid for this body. 
bought and paid for with the blood of his sacrifice. Right? And so that was just a beginning, a starting point for folks to be able to express a little bit of love and appreciation for all that he's done for us. We never could pay him back for the sacrifice he made on the cross. Amen? No matter how hard we tried, no matter how much we give, we cannot bargain with God that way. Right? And it saddened me. I've got some folks in the church here that wrote to some well-known preachers, and I'll go ahead and spread the name for today, but I uh, asked him, would you pray for my family? He goes, well, why don't you be faithful and send me a bunch of money, and when you're sending your tithes to my church, then we'll faithfully pray for you. I want you to know, if you don't even give a penny to this church, if you ask us to pray, we're going to pray for you. Amen. Because we're more concerned about the heart than your giving, right? Because if, we don't, if God doesn't have your heart and He don't have you, then we don't need the money as a token. We need you. That is our focus because God will provide and He has in so many ways around here, right? More than we can do ourselves, right? We're not, you can't bargain with God or threaten. Well, if, if everything's not going right, I'm going to withhold my tithes and, and watch the church fall. Well, the last time I looked at his word, it said, even the gates of hell won't prevail against his church. Right? And the last couple of weeks and months, we've had all kinds of threats. Just this last week, some folks came up from the uh, uh, marshal from the fire department and said, we hear you're illegally doing this over here with that and this. And I said, oh, is that right? Well, come on in. We'd be glad to show you around. And, I, and they said, well, you can't do this. And I said, I understand. We, we've, we've done our homework. We've read. And they said, oh, well, we're sorry. And I said, it's okay. I said, that's how people are. What's unfortunate is they claim the name of Christ and want to do that to the church. The world is already against us. But brothers and sisters in Christ, how foolishness is that? And that's the church of Corinth. And this is extra this morning. That's what the whole Corinthian was about. Those were carnal Christians that got so carnal with each other that they wanted to sue each other. And Paul says, you're shaming the name of Christ wanting to do that. That's not how to be. If your brother or sister does something for you and you get wrong against you and you can't make it right, then you leave it to God, the, the judge who will take care of it. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, hit the Lord. But we have so much being done in the name of Christ. People in the community says, what makes that church different from that church? Because there's a hypocrites there, hypocrites there. There's hypocrites everywhere. Right? But the point is, who are we following? Are we following man? Or are we following the book? Right? We've got to get back to following biblical principles. And that's why it's so important for us to be right and clean and pure. Because people are looking for excuses to say, well, it's their fault why I'm not following God. No. It wasn't Jacob's. Jacob couldn't blame his mother and father for his choices. Although they set up obstacles in his life. Yes, but he was responsible for his own choices. But guess what? Those were big obstacles. And that's the application we want to see this morning is we don't want to be like that and set up obstacles in front of our children. Isn't that what we've been saying for the last couple of weeks? It's not just enough to say, do as I say, but to do as we do. If we don't give them right examples, you can say all you want all day long, and they're going to go, yeah, right. You say this, but you're doing this, and so I'm just going to do what you're doing. Right? If our children are doing things, and we've done them, then we are partly to blame. I mean, yes, they're responsible for their choices, but we've got to take ownership and ask God to forgive us and to help us not to continue that on. And for all, most of his life, Jacob kept wrestling and being deceiving. So how do you think his children are going to respond? Well, we're going to look at that in a second. Let's go a little bit further here. Turn over to chapter 31. Chapter 31. So, we're not going to look at all the scriptures that talk about this, but where was Jacob up for 20 years? We'll look at that verse in a minute. It tells us where he was at. But he was working for his uncle Laban. Seven years for one wife. Seven years for another wife. And six years for sheep. 20 years. All right, and we'll look at that in just a second. But look at verses 1 through 3. I want you to see this. Chapter 31, verses 1 through 3. Now Jacob heard what Laban's sons were saying. Jacob has taken all that our fathers was our fathers and has built this wealth from what belonged to our father. When God's blessing is upon people that are doing right, 
it doesn't take long for other Christians to become envious, jealous, and start backbiting and mouthing and causing trouble and causing division and splits. That's why the Bible says there is great peace and contentment. And that's what Paul said, whatever state I'm in, whether I have a lot or have little, I've learned to find contentment. So he goes on here to say, verse 2, And Jacob saw from Laban's face that his attitude toward him had not, was not the same. But here's the key verse. The Lord said to him, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I'll be with you. Here again, God is telling Jacob, I got a plan. I'm in control of all that's going on. I see what's going on. I've been with you all these 20 years. Now it's time for you to go back. What do you think the first thing that Jacob comes to his mind? Oh, wow, I get to go back. This is exciting. Right? Maybe uh, go back and see my mom, my dad. Oh, what about brother Esau? That's the thought came to his mind. I'm going to have to face my brother Esau. 20 years seems like a long time. Right? And maybe he's forgotten, maybe he hasn't. We, we, we confuse forgiveness with forgetting. God forgives us, He don't forget. He chooses not to bring it up again. And that's the problem with you and I and the world, is we confuse forgetfulness with forgiveness. When we forgive or we want to be forgiven, it's a choice we make not to keep bringing it up. But the pain, the scars, those things are going to still remain. Think about Jesus. When they crucified Jesus, does he still not have the nail-pierced hands and the, the, the hole in his side? When he rose from the dead, did Thomas not see those? And so he forgave, but it's still there. The scars, the wounds, right? So forgiveness, uh, another thing about forgiveness, is it's not a, you know what, I, I need to take my time forgiving. It's a process. That's not an attribute of God. Forgiveness is something we grant, and it should be immediate. It's not, well, let me work through it and think about it. Did God do that when He saved us? If He acted the same way we, we do, we'd be in trouble. Ephesians 4.32 is, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Aren't you glad that He doesn't say, It's a process. I'm going to give you 10 years, and once you've proven yourself faithful, then I'm going to forgive you, I'm going to bless you, and then you can be used by me. But that's how we do to each other, right? And, and family. And, and let me hasten to say, if you do your part, and you try to seek forgiveness, you seek reconciliation, and the other person won't grant it, then that's on them. But make sure you're doing your part and not lying roots of bitterness to grow in your heart and you're not giving the forgiveness. And if you need forgiveness because you've wronged someone and you try to seek that and you do everything you can to let them know you're sorry and, and you do everything you can to make it right and they won't give it to you, then again, you leave it with God. That's another point. Nowhere in Scripture does it say, oh, we need to learn to forgive ourselves. There's only one person who can forgive, ultimately, and, that, and that's God, right? So we need to stick on His Word and quit allowing these feelings and thoughts and philosophies of the world to dictate our thinking and manipulate our, our lives, how we're living, right? You've heard me say many times, the chains that God has freed you from, quit putting them back on yourself. Quit shackling yourself. It only brings anxiety, depression, fear, guilt, and all those things lead to tremendous turmoil inside of you, the destruction, and in your family. Can you imagine all this turmoil? And here's Jacob. As soon as God says, I'm sending you back to your, your homeland, the home that I'm going to bless you, that I said I was going to bless your father with, and your grandfather, instead of being all excited and overwhelmed with joy, he's fearful. Right? Because he didn't deal with his sin. A lot of people that think they've lost their salvation, it's not really their salvation if they were really saved. It's that they haven't dealt with sin. And, and that's what the initial part of guilt is, is to deal with the sin, let God cleanse you, forgive you, and then move on. But if you waddle in that, or if you ignore it, or push it underneath the rug, or try to move on, and make excuses and blame others, then it's going to fester into guilt, and it's going to be very destructive, and that's not what God intended. And that's what we got to learn is, what is God's 
purpose and what he's trying to do in our lives and to submit ourselves rather than fighting and wrestling against him. And we're fixing to continue here. So God says, I'm going to be with you. Now let's move on real quick here. Chapter 32. So he's going back. He's going to meet his brother. This is where the, the rubber's going to meet the road here. I want us to see this for the next few minutes here. Verse 1 of 32. Jacob went on his way, and God's angel met him. When he saw them, Jacob said, This is God's camp. So he called that place Mahanam. Jacob sent messengers. Now watch this. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He commanded them, you are to say, now watch this, to my Lord Esau, this is what your what servant Jacob says. Right? You, you can see it and hear it in his voice how scared he is of his brother. This was the chosen one that God was going to use to have many children, many nations. And yet, rather than resting in the Lord, he was scared to death. Kind of reminds us of Elijah. Remember when Elijah cleared all those false prophets? But then one woman named Jezebel put so much fear in him that he ran and hid in the cave and said, God, take my life. I'm done. Right? When we take our eyes off of God, that's exactly what's going to happen. Fear will overtake us, overwhelm us, and we will have no strength to go on. So he, he says this, I have been staying with Laban and have been delayed until now. I have oxen, I have donkeys, flocks, males and female servants. I have sent this message to inform my Lord in order to seek your favor. Alright, so he sends them along. The messengers go. They come back. Verse 6. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau. He is coming to meet you and he has 400 men with him. Oh, <laughs> you know, what did my brother say? He didn't say nothing. He's on his way and he's got 400 soldiers with him. And these dudes were probably five too, but these messengers said they are giants, probably seven feet, and they had spears as long as the wall was. I mean, you could probably just hear them, right? Just like those 12 spies that went to Canaan. Ten were bad and two were good, right? Exaggeration is a powerful tool. And we let that mind wander. And I tell you, we're facing all kinds of giants when they're really only four foot or five foot tall. Right? Because again, we've taken our eyes off of God. 400 men are coming. Verse 7. Jacob says, okay. Well, I'm ready for him. We can handle him. Uh, I know greater is he that is with me than he that is in the world. Verse 7. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Didn't God just tell him previously that I'm going to be with you? And I'm going to provide for you and take care of you? But until you surrender, you're going to always doubt God. His goodness, His faithfulness. Let's stop for a minute. When is the last time God's lied to either one, any of you in this room today? I would hope that all of you would say never. Never. We need to keep reminding ourselves that God is faithful to us even when we're not faithful to Him. God never lies to us, even when we lie to Him. Remember those vows that Jacob said, I'll do this if you do this. And yet Jacob still didn't do it, but God still did His part. All the time, all the time, he was afraid, distressed. He divided the people with him into two camps, along with the flocks, cattle, and camels. He thought, if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, the remaining one can't escape. Here we go, here's two camps here today. I tell you what, this is the camp I love over here. So, hey guys, you go in front of me, okay? I love you, but guess what? You're going to go ahead and lay down your lives and sacrifice for me because i got to protect number one. That's what Jacob was doing. Right? I love you. You know, you've been faithful all these months and years, but God bless you. When you get to Esau, let him know I'm back here, and I sent y'all as a, as a token. Hopefully he'll have favor. But if he's still mad at me, well, I'll see, because he'll kill you first. And maybe me and this other group over here, we can run and hightail it out of here. He's not quite surrendered yet, is he? Not quite surrendered. Skip over to verse 17. He told the first one, When my brother Esau meets you and asks who you belong to, 
And who, what are these animals ahead of you? Then tell him, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my lord Esau. And look, he is behind us. And he also told the second one, the third, and everyone who was walking behind the animals, say the same thing to Esau when you find him. You are to say, look, your servant Jacob is right behind you. For he thought, I want to appease Esau with the gift that is going to go ahead of me. After that, I can face him and perhaps he will forgive me. We don't need to buy our forgiveness. We just need to do what's right. You, you can't appease God. You, you, you can't buy God's love, bribe Him. You just need to ask for forgiveness. And realize that where you're wrong, you're wrong. And when you wrong someone else, you just have to own it. Right? But we are so quick to say, well, maybe if I do this or this. and No, just deal with it. Call it what it is and ask for forgiveness. 1 John 1 9. Love that verse. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He doesn't forget, but He separates them as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't bring it up before us anymore. God loves us. Who brings it up is the accuser, the father of lies, Satan. So he goes on to do this. Verse 22. During the night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two uh, female servants, and his eleven sons crossed the fort of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with all his possessions. So he sends them ahead of him, and then this is where we have the wrestling with, with God. The incarnate of Jesus. The first time that Jesus appears to Jacob before he came on this earth and walked upon this earth. And so we won't read all that this morning, but I want you to read all that on your own time. But I will skip down to verse 29. As he's wrestling with him, Jacob says, Please tell me your name. But he answered, Why do you ask me my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named that place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. He said, I have been delivered. The sun shone on him, and, and he passed by Peniel with a limp. Alright, so here it is. He saw God face to face. God's delivered him. And now you think he's going to be ready to meet his brother? Well, look at 30, chapter 33. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward with him with how many men? That's right. Here they are. They haven't left. They haven't gone away. 400. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two servant female servants. He put the female servants and their children first, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. That's another story for another time. His favorite wife, Rachel, his favorite son, Joseph, put them for last. He himself went on ahead and bowed to the ground. How many times? Seven times until he, until he approached his brother. Now what does that signify? Why would he do that? Because he was treating his brother like a king. And he was like, hey, I'm, I, I want forgiveness so bad that I'm going to be in your servitude. Right? So he was trying to do everything he could in his own power, with his own thinking. And brothers and sisters, when you and I lean into our own understanding, as Proverbs 3, 5, 6 warn us, we get in trouble. We don't need to lean on to our own understanding, but we need to acknowledge God in all of our ways. He should acknowledge. God said he's going to be with me. I don't know how he's going to work it out. I'm just going to trust God and I'm going to do the right thing and God's going to work this out. But no, here again, he's trying to deceive, manipulate, and control. And every time we get our backs against the wall, maybe an extra bill comes in or, or sickness happens in the family, what do we do? Do we run to God and we pray? Or do we say, I can handle this. I can fix it. I can work more hours. I can do this. I, I, I. Instead of saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Right? I shall lack no good thing because the Lord is my shepherd. If we would rest there, how much peace would we have rather than restless, sleepless nights? All because we do not take it to Him in prayer. And think about this. If we don't do that, and we see our children struggling, we say, children, just go to God, and, and God will hear your prayers. What, what are they going to say? Yeah, right. You don't pray, so why am I going to pray? You're not trusting God, so why should I trust God? Right? So this is the importance of that, to see what is going on. They are watching and observing our lives, and it's not enough for us just to say, do this and do another thing. So, what happens? After he bows to the ground, look what happens. Verse 4. 
Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Then they wept. Esau was ready to make it right too. Twenty years of all this. Twenty years. And Esau was ready and Jacob was fearing instead of just trusting the Lord. And here's Esau who sold his birthright because he wasn't following the ways of God. But yet he still wanted reconciliation. So many times we are afraid of the other side because we cannot read their minds, can't read their hearts. We're unwilling to step out and see what God will do. Let me challenge us today applicationally. Step out and let God show up. Quit doubting, quit staying in fear. And it may not turn out the way you want to, but do your part. You won't know until you do your part. But as long as you keep being controlled by fear, by anger, by hurt and resentment, there will be never no healing. Ever. Right? He's already lost his mother. He's fixing to lose his father. So can you imagine losing all that and not getting it right? And so many people deal with that because they don't make it right while they have the chance. Today is the chance to make it right. That's what God's speaking. One of his things he's speaking today. He's probably telling us right now, make sure things are right from your perspective. Even if the other person's un unwilling to make it right on their part. But pray. Ask God to work in their hearts, to soften their hearts. And you come with humility and not pride. And God will do a great work. But if you come with, well, you did this more than I did, that's probably not a good way to start out, right? No. You know, when, when I wronged my children, I didn't say, hey, you know what? The reason I yelled at you because you didn't obey in the first place. No, I had to humble myself saying, hey, you know what? I shouldn't have yelled. I lost my temper. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Start there and then say, okay, now then you can remind. There's no excuse for what I did, but this is, again, the obstacle that created it. But do your part first. Don't try to justify why you responded. Right? And that's how we do in relationships. Well, you did this, you said this, and I said this. Deal with what you did, own it, and then God will work on the other person, right? But that's not how we want to do it. I'm going to fix you, and then I'll get fixed. Amen? We got to fix self. That's what we can fix. So Esau ran, hugged him, and kissed on him. One more part, and we'll finish. Skip over. To verse 12. Verse 12, and we'll finish with this little stretch here. There's so much more that needs to be drawn out, but I'll give you this part and tell you where to go. So after forgiveness has been established, after Esau loved his brother, Esau wants to spend time with his brother. And look what he says, verse 12. Then Esau said, let's move on and I'll go ahead of you. Jacob replied, my Lord knows that the children are weak and I have nursing sheep and cattle. If they are driven harder for one day, the whole herd will die. Let me, let my Lord go ahead of his servant and I will continue on slowly at a pace suited to the livestock and the children until I come to my Lord at Seir. So, Esau invites him to come to his place, going to show love. Jacob, what does he do? Does he be truthful and honest with him? He says, okay, I'll come. Just give me a couple of days because, you know, i got a big family and, and animals to take care of. All right? So the deception continues on. Watch this. And by this time, I want you to understand, the 12 tribes of Judah, those children, are with them. They're in their 20s. They're hearing their father again deceive their uncle, his brother. Right? They're seeing it. They're hearing. Dad's saying, we're going. We're fixing to go hang out with the family. Everything's going to be good. Everything's all forgiven. Let's go have a good time. And let's see how honest and open Dad's being. Watch what happens. Verse 16. The day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Alright, here's the podium. Seir is south east of where they were. Jacob went to Sukkoth. You know where Sukkoth was? North and west. So what just happened? The opposite direction. Hey, give me a couple days, I'm coming. Yeah, he needs a couple days because he's going in the wrong direction. He just lied and deceived his brother again. Right? When is Jacob going to get it right and surrender and quit deceiving and lying? When is he going to say, let my yeas be yeas and my nays be nays. When am I going to be that provider, that protector, that leader of the home? Right? Let's all stand and pray and let's ask God to show us and to teach us. Lord, help us 
to lead right and not to follow in these same footsteps that we've seen the examples given to us in the Bible. These were given to us so that we could learn from them and realize consequences are great for the choices we make. And they last for a long time. And we didn't get to the part where uh, the father died. He was 180. Remember I made that point earlier? 160 when he made the blessing, but he died at 180. How many years is that? Oh, I thought he was dying. He had to live for another 20 years in regret of what he did to his two sons. How he pushed that rather than letting God's plan unfold. Can you imagine when he finally did die, the regret he had? And the scripture's going to say, and you go read that, after the two brothers made up, they went and buried their father, and then they went on their different ways. But what a sad reunion to see your father after 20 years and realize what took place. Not too many words were exchanged at that point. You know what, and we always say around here, it's important how we finish, and that's true. But don't waste so many years in between at the same time. God is uh, merciful, and God will, at the very end, take you, right? And, and if you are saved and you live like you want to, there's still going to be something for you. But do you want that kind of carnage in your life, in your family, your friends? And, and that's what's at stake here. It does, our sins don't just affect us, it affects who? Our whole family, our friends, your church family. You think about that here. Do you really believe that the folks around here love you? If not, then you're in the wrong place. right? You need to be in a place where you know that the people love you. And I think you are here because you know, brothers and sisters beside you, left and right, look left and right. They love you. And so if you make decisions that affect you and your family, you're, you're, you're going to hurt the body of Christ. And, and we've gone through those things. And we've, we've seen God do some purges. And, there, and there's probably other purges in the future. And those are not fun and they're not exciting. They're very hurtful. But God's Word will not be mocked. The world may laugh at His Word. They may make excuses and say, well, that's just Old Testament or whatever. That doesn't hold with God. If He said it, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter what any church says. He doesn't care what Cumberland says unless it's preaching His Word. He's not interested in the pastor's opinions, the pastor's stories, if it's not in line with the Word of God. And so that's what we have to understand is, that's our goal every week is to preach His Word and that His standards would be upheld and we all fall short of it. Myself, just like all of us. When I preach these messages, there are to me too an understanding there's much in my life that I have to work on for forgiveness. There's much in my life that I have to make sure that I'm leading properly my family. We all have mistakes and sins in our past that could haunt us. But that's where we ask for forgiveness and we move on. Choose today to move on. Don't stay in the same place. Don't stay in that same rut. Wherever you're at, let God work and heal us. Let's pray.